Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Maybe uh, for all of you who is in uh, Indonesia and maybe good uh, evening or good uh, afternoon for everyone around the world. So in this uh, session, I will be as a chair of this session and today uh, this session will be a lecture from uh, Premana Wadayanti Premadi PhD about uh, yeah about uh, uh, cosmology introduction uh, to cosmology. So uh, yeah, before 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 we start uh, this uh, lecture, I will uh, read. Uh, uh, Premana uh, CV. Uh, she was uh, graduated from uh, ITB for her uh, bachelor, and he I uh, see continue uh, her PhD in uh, University of Texas uh, Austin, and then uh, he went to uh, Japan to uh, continue her, her postdoc uh, in Astronomical Institute uh, Tohoku University. And now uh, she is a, a director of uh, Bosca Observatory and also faculty member in uh, Institute uh, Technology Bandung. And uh, before we welcoming her, uh, I have to remind you that uh, please uh, rename your username as uh, instructed before. Uh, like uh, below, so you can uh, see uh, the example uh, like uh, below. And also for participants uh, from a lecture of uh, cosmology uh, in Institute Technology, Technology Bandung, you can uh, rename your name by adding uh, Cosmo in front of your name. Okay, and then uh, also we have a Zoom ethic etiquette uh, for participants. Uh, please mute your uh, microphone and turn off your video unless uh, I uh, allow it. And please uh, give your full attention to the lecture and you can type your comments or question in the chat and or uh, raise your hand. So in the Q&A session, I would like to invite you uh, to uh, uh, send uh, to speak up uh, to send your comment uh, directly to a speaker uh, by the end of uh, her lecture. Okay, uh, maybe we can. Uh, I invite you all to welcoming uh, uh, Premana. Okay, uh, please, uh, Premana, some. Right. Thank you, Dr. Jailani. Thank you very much, everyone. Greetings to all of you. I hope you're still uh, eager. This is only the, the second day of our uh, summer school, and um, I, I, uh, I'm happy to be able to uh, start uh, on the first day um, reminding you of, of uh, cosmology. So, um, I, uh, I'm sure many, many of you, most of you, I'm sure, are already familiar with the basic of cosmology and perhaps have uh, done uh, quite a bit of uh, research in cosmology. So what I'm trying to do today is not very much of uh, teaching you cosmology, but um, giving you some, some uh, review very, very quickly. Uh, things that we learn in semester, we'll try to cramp everything in just perhaps three hours. Uh, you know, the first session and then the, the next one coming up in uh, about uh, oh, maybe two o'clock, I think. And also uh, um, just to to uh, familiarize uh, the platform of doing cosmology, which uh, the uh, subsequent lectures might be able to to just uh, pick up from here. So basically, you know, if we talk about distance, what actually we mean by that? If we talk about um, uh, 
cosmological parameters, what we mean by that. So nothing uh, really new from my lectures, but I hope you still uh, uh, find it uh, uh, useful. Right, I'll just uh, start with uh, uh, my, my presentation. So I'll, I'll do share screen from now. So Anton, I think we'll uh, uh, moderate the Q&A session uh, or, you know, when it's time to take a break, you just, just let me know. Okay. Let's see, are you able to see my my PowerPoint? Yes, you can see the PowerPoint. Not yet. Mm. But so hang on, let me just redo this. Is it on now? Yes, is it on now? Great. Okay, let me do the full screen. Right. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the first uh, session of uh, introduction to cosmology, and uh, for all the content i i uh, revert everything to these two wonderful textbooks uh barbara ryden introduction to cosmology and also peter schneider extra galaxy and cosmology this you know if you follow these two books either of them or both of them you you'll find everything that i i i introduce or reintroduce to you here are already in there so i would really suggest that you uh, go back through those two books if you have, if you are not too familiar with the material. So, um, cosmology is the study of the whole universe. Its uh, its content, its structure, and how it evolves. So, it's it's pretty much everything that you know one would know about the physical universe is uh, contained in the study of uh, modern cosmology. But um, modern cosmology actually started little by little, even uh, centuries ago. And then we, we know that the name of uh, Kepler and uh, Newton, and then also uh, ideas that bring people into thinking about the universe more than what they can observe. But on the other hand, what they can observe about the universe is something that uh, put questions into uh, scientific uh, uh, the realm. And then that's the, the uh, working ideas of physics and mathematics becoming the, the foundation of how people think about the universe. So, uh, uh, we, we learn how to do cosmology starting from observation, basically, is that. Now, for modern cosmology, it's, uh, it's basically the same thing, except that with the use of uh, modern telescopes, people do get to see um, larger volumes, contents of the universe within larger volumes. So uh, th these are just a few of um, um, observational uh, evidence that made people into thinking uh, very, very carefully about how the universe is and how it, 
how things work within within the universe. What I mean by work is of course how how physical processes uh, do work in our universe. And the first one is the uh, famous Olber paradox, which question if there are very very many stars, why our night sky is dark? So uh, we'll go through that just a little bit, and then uh, we'll see that galaxies, uh, which I write here, uh, with are larger than twenty, meaning having uh, uh, brightness in the R. Uh, uh, wavelength in, in in the red section of the electromagnetic spectrum larger than 20 meaning it's uh, it's uh, the dim uh, uh, part or the section of the distribution of galaxies uh, which tells you those galaxies must be majority very very far from us uh, are smoothly distributed meaning that within very, very large volumes, the galaxies seem to be rather uniformly distributed. And also uh, regarding galaxies, uh, people have noticed that those galaxies, uh, which are very far from us in, in majority, do recede from us. So they move further, further away from us. And with interestingly, uh, higher speed, with the more uh, distant they are. Now, uh, the next thing that we pe uh, people uh, learn, this is way after uh, the Olber paradox and also the receding motion of galaxies, is that there is a thermal evolution that um, is resulting from what we now know as the expansion of the universe. Now, that universe being a closed system, meaning it has uh, uh, everything within itself and we don't have anything beyond the universe, even the, the, uh, the word beyond the universe or outside the even universe is meaningless in this case, which I, I'll elaborate much later. Uh, the idea is that the universe expands in an adiabatic manner, gives us a way of understanding the universe in a more physical uh, way. That is, we could study the thermal evolution of it. And that gives uh, um, ways for us to, to relate time and processes within the universe. Uh, evolution and that gives us two in particular evidence that uh, the theoretical idea of those evolution uh, scheme uh, is supported by by evidence so those particular evidence are primordial nucleus synthesis product in particular the helium-4 and the cosmic micro background radiation Another thing that people, you know, much, uh, much, much more uh, in the in the development of cosmology and extragalactic study is the uh, existence of uh, what seem to be very, very uh, developed galaxies, galaxies which uh, seem to have a large, massive um, core uh, with probably very compact and um, constitute uh, black holes at the very, very high redshift, meaning those objects must have uh, been uh, uh, constructed at the very early uh, epoch of the universe. So that gives you some idea that the universe must be very old to be able to host all these uh, very, very developed objects. So I hope to be able to uh, talk about these, um, you know, little bit by little bit, but more importantly are what people could conclude uh, using this fundamental observation as, uh, as a direction. So 
just uh, a, a, a few uh, reminder about Olbers paradox. Basically, Olbers paradox is questioning if stars are pretty much filling all the universe, why the night sky is dark. The idea is that uh, if, if you see, uh, if you put yourself an observer at the center of, uh, you know, your observation uh, sphere, and then you think or you assume that uh, the universe is, a, you know, very, very large sphere within which you could uh, construct a concentric ring. And within each of those rings, you assume that there are uh, an equal number density of stars. So you, you know, you make ring upon ring upon ring upon ring. And, 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 and if you further assume that the uh, luminosity of those stars are pretty much the same, say L, then the, the total intensity that you would receive from all those stars, from all those layers of rings, should give you an infinity. Meaning this, the dark, this, the night sky should be very, very bright. But uh, in fact, it is not. So uh, there must be something within uh, those assumptions uh, which are not uh, quite correct. But which one? And uh, if, if there's anything is, and if you if you uh, read um, uh, the history of the development of cosmology, people did try various kind of uh, uh, ex explanation why the, the, the night sky is dark. You know, there must be some some dust, smoke, or whatever that uh, absorb the the uh, the the light from from all the stars and uh, also you know stars might be produced the same way fire is that people know on earth so you know they create smoke and the smoke um, just obstruct all the lights that coming out from from each of those stars but but nevertheless with all those explanation if you you uh, direct your your vision in any direction you know you will see a star at at the end of your line of sight so so it seems like you know if one star is covered there there are still very very many stars that you that to that would compensate the 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 one particular star which is obstructed so th those explanation don't work so uh, people come back to the assumption rather than trying to explain with uh, with phenomena so they think that in order for this in integral not to be infinite is you have to have um, the integrand which you know fall off for for larger r so they try this. So what if this n times L, which is the number density times the luminosity of each star, falls off as one on R. So you, so as, as R goes to infinity, so will uh, n, n times L will go to zero. So uh, meaning that the, the total in intensity would just be approximately this value where r max is the maximum radius beyond which you wouldn't see you would you would not see any more star so you know this the number of stars diminishing with with the the, the more distance you go so that looks or feels rather logical but you don't. You do need to to have a physical processes that to back you up. Why would there be less star with a larger volume or larger ring that you would you would look? So 
you know, the activation works, but you still need to have a physical reason to, to, to explain it further. But in any case, if you apply that into uh, our observed universe, for example, if you give the value of NL, the value of the um, uh, of, of uh, galaxies within a very local universe, meaning you know something that I will introduce later. This uh, this uh, term redshift. So for redshift, much much less than one, meaning a very local volume with with us at the center. Then the NL is about this, about a hundred million uh, solar luminosity per megaparsec cubic. And if you use, uh, you know, a, a, a well-received cosmological model at the moment, then you, you will have a, a horizon distance, which is, you know, the, the volume of the, your observable universe is about C over H naught, where H naught is uh, the Hubble constant. I apologize for having to put uh, terms which I actually will introduce much later, but this is just give you an idea of the of the size of the observable universe. So if you uh, put that as the as the maximum uh, uh, radius into your integral, then you would have a, a total flux of all the galaxies within our horizon, meaning if you get to see all the galaxies, you know, until the, the dimmest one to within our horizon, within our observable radius, then you get this number. And it turned out to be to be very small, you know. If you see the the uh, uh, the first uh, number, it's, it, it, it feels large, 10 to the 11 solar lum luminosity. But remember, this is over a megaparsec square. So it's a huge uh, area. But if you like to use a more familiar unit, you will get uh, 10 to the minus 11, sorry, uh, solar luminosity over one astronomical unit square. So in an area with radius between, between the sun and us, you, you, you put a very, very small uh, object that emits 10 to the minus 11 solar luminosity. So that's really small. So with this uh, illustration, it, uh, it gives you an idea why the night sky is dark. So, so basically what you receive is, is very small. Now, this is, of course, not even considering that the universe is expanding, just, just considering that the number density of uh, emitting object is, is not constant with, with the increasing radius from us. Right. So the, the second uh, uh, a fundamental evidence that people offer for, for doing cosmology is to, just considering galaxies as building blocks of the large scale structure of the universe. And some people may ask, why not stars? Because galaxies, after all, are uh, consisted of stars. Well, if we talk about cosmology, which um, considers the, 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 the universe as a huge uh, volume, you, you, you talk about gigaparsec in, uh, in as a, as a representative scale, then galaxies do represent the building blocks. They are the smaller objects that one can see that you can pinpoint their location, their movement in within those scales. And you can still uh, uh, distinguish one galaxy from, from another. Uh, with stars, you, you, you could hardly do that. So if you go to a uh, a far galaxy, and you know, most likely what you see is a galaxy as a, as a 
uh, distribution of light without you being able to distinguish one star to one star to another. So, so galaxies are building blocks. Now, if you go to a very large volume, within which, of course, you get to see uh, uh, only the very, very bright galaxies, but those galaxies would appear quite, quite uh, dim to you because they are very, very far. So, so therefore, the the uh, the the idea of putting numbers into the uh, magnitude in R larger than 20. So with this picture, you could see that each each um, light here, each point of light are, is, is galaxies. So there are very, very many of them in, the, in, in this map, and there are um, millions, and they are all um, surveyed galaxies. Now, uh, for those of you who were uh, not familiar with astronomy, um, I, I put this little uh, map of our Earth, but you put you open the globe as such that you could see all the um, continents on one uh, flat surface. So this is the same idea. So you see the whole sky, the the, 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 the sphere of the sky, and then you open it. But the only difference, but very important difference is that, that you are at the center of this of this large globe. Whereas when you look at this uh, Earth globe, but you are looking uh, on it, you, you're outside of the Earth when you, when you are able to see this. With this, you're actually seeing things with you at the center. Now, um, I would just indulge uh, myself by showing you this um, galaxy surface. There are a number of them. There are very many of them, and this is uh, a list of uh, one of the uh, most recent. And um, this stretch of lights are areas in the sky that have been surveyed, and these are uh, the various colors are the various mission that survey them. And what we see here, of course, again, we are at the center of our, our observation. We are not at the center of the universe, but we are at the center of our observation. And, uh, and they are uh, surveyed. Um, some have uh, the same um, frequency region, and some have different frequency region. And here you could see that uh, each frequency of observation tells you a different aspects of the galaxy. So by having them observe the a multiple wavelength gives you an, a more a comprehensive idea of uh, those galaxies. So um, of course some of these uh, um, surfaces do overlap in their coverage, but that's only give you, again as I said, the comprehensive uh, knowledge of the galaxies, each of them that, that uh, they have uh, multiple surveys. So the, uh, the orientation, the, the, the circular orientation gives you uh, which direction you look. Um, so it's oftentimes they're, they're uh, indicated by what we call as, uh, uh, whoops, Asensio recta. And their 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 unit is hours or degrees. Now um, the concentric rings are indicated by what it's called here look back time, um, which tells you actually how far to the past those galaxies are located, meaning that um, how far they are from us. So with light being the the agent of uh, information and it and it propagates with uh, uh, limited um, speed 300 kilometer 300,000 kilometer per second meaning the farther out they are the more time they would need to reach us so uh, the look back time is also an indication of distance from 
those objects to us. So basically, this is a, a two-dimensional map, one dimension being the orientation. So, you know, we look east, west, north, south, and, and, the, and the radius of, of the ring tells you how far they are. So this is a suppressed um, map, of course. You don't get to see the declination. The, the, so the, you would you would um, you would expect you, you know a three dimensional because the stars has so orientation or also have a heights or uh, from from your horizon. It's not just you know you, you look east west north south but you also look how far they are upon uh, above the horizon so those particular dimension is being suppressed you, you just don't show it here because you, it's very hard to put everything in three dimension and and again the the idea is to give you uh, uh, the the perception of how galaxy is distributed in time or in depth or in volume as well as in, in spread uh, within each particular um, uh, spherical surface. Now what we see here that the galaxies are very uniform. That's what this very large volume survey tell you. It's, uh, they, have a, they have very, very um, subtle structure. It's like, like foam or more like um, um, sponge but uh, if in any which way you look if you take large volume as your sample then you see that the the the, the distribution of galaxy here or here or here are pretty much the same meaning that you can't really distinguish which direction you are looking at those distributions are almost the same and i can come back to this picture and and convince you that the universe do have a, a similar uh, large-scale feature, no matter where or which direction you look. Okay, this, of course, the detail could be very, you know, could be different, but on average, the feature are very, very similar. So now, in in the next lecture, we will try to quantize that in a more uh, proper way, which is, which um, tells you what I mean by, by a similar feature must be uh, put into a more quantized um, um, parameter as such that we could put them into mathematical operation uh, for our purpose. So um, the other thing about galaxies are that they are moving away from us. And uh, Hubble and his team had discovered that the sense that uh, uh, galaxies are not just moving away from us, they, they seem to be moving away in a, in a very organized manner that he put together on this very famous plot, which is called the Hubble diagram, that the farther they are, I mean, those galaxies, the, the faster they are moving away from us. Now, this um, uh, graph that, that, that Hubble and team put together has a different way of indicating distance. They put magnitude, in, uh, in photographic, um, which was the, the medium that uh, people uh, took pictures those days. So this, this was in the, in the beginning of the 20th century, so 1910, 1920s, around those times, around the, the time that Einstein put together his theory of relativity. So they put, uh, they talk about this, Einstein had problem with this equation, why things are not staying static with this equation, whereas Hubble said, look, everything is moving away from us, and I don't think we are at the very 
very uh, special place in the universe or what is it that we are seeing and uh, uh, I put here uh, at, on the same slide the, the uh, a similar idea of graph that was put together by Wendy Friedman and Mike Turner in 2003 and this also, also uh, is called the Hubble, Hubble diagram and it says the same thing that the galaxies are moving away from us with uh, with a, a particular manner the more distant they are the faster they are moving from us and what people use for this um, uh, uh, diagram you know for the recent years are very very far galaxies so these are very nearby galaxies and these are up to quite far galaxies and they have uh, they have uh, um, almost um, similar tendency of course the detail is something that we could argue about but um, those galaxies are indicated uh, by a number of uh, uh, objects that uh, we will see later on how we, we determine distances but Coming back to this this idea of, of uh, uh, Hubble diagram is that this is a very very clever way that people then use to to um, estimate distance and and even later on uh, the age of the universe. If you look again at this graph, so the the vertical axis is the velocity, the same same here, and the the horizontal axis is distance. Now, what people use for for indicating distance is uh, is uh, something that you know depends on on what they have in their in their data. So, where when um, Hubble and, and his team was working, they use um, that photographic uh, magnitude or or brightness as as the indication. So, and uh, astronomy has this rather weird way of uh, of uh, quantizing brightness. So the, the larger the the number, meaning the 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 less bright they are or the dimmer they are. And if you have um, objects of pretty much equal intrinsic brightness, so the observed uh, number of uh, m here give some idea of your distance so the dimmer they are the the farther they are so so uh, galaxies with uh, magnitudes of 18 is dimmer than the one which has magnitude 12 so in this case we interpret this galaxies here is much much farther away than the galaxy here and whereas the velocity one determined by using or reading the the spectrum of each galaxy um, now you know that each um, uh, chemical element emits or absorb a very very unique at a very unique frequency of our wavelength. Now, if those uh, objects which emits the light, which spectrum you get, is um, moving with respect to you, then the, those lines that uh, is indicated by the, the various chemical elements or even atom uh, would be shifted. So if the source is moving away in a positive uh, direction meaning it, it goes away from you and you have a positive uh, velocity then the frequency would shift to the lower one or the wavelength to the longer one and uh, so therefore you will have a indication of the speed the larger the shift the larger the speed now with hubble um, Hubble uh, diagram that also means 
the larger the distance. And uh, for cosmology, people uh, try to put this together and introduce the term redshift, which is the uh, difference in wavelength between the observed one and the emitted one divided by the emitted one. Now, a, a positive Z would mean that you observed the wavelength of the photon uh, longer than with the one which is emitted. And this is a, a proportional to the speed of the receding galaxies from you. So this has uh, been used really extensively, in particular for, for galaxies of the very small z, for which the this relation works. So for very small z, meaning very, very uh, uh, close galaxies, small d's, so there's a very good relation between z, which tells you the speed of the receding galaxies and its distance. So h naught here, which is called the Hubble constant, is nothing but the gradient, the value of the gradient of this line. And it's got, of course, uh, a funny unit. It's got the unit of kilometer per second coming from the velocity over megaparsec coming from uh, the distance. So it's kilometer per second per megaparsec. So a Hubble constant tells you uh, how fast the universe is expanding. Because the, the interpretation of this graph is that those galaxies which are receding from us are just merely flowing away following the expansion of the universe. They are not really moving by themselves. Okay. Now, uh, uh, of course, there are, there are uh, more recent um, Hubble uh, graph like this, um, but I'm, I'm, what I'm, why I'm, I'm showing this rather old one is that, you know, it's for more of pedagogical and historical reason. It's, it's very difficult to to uh, to put together this seemingly uh, simple graph. It is a simple graph, but you will see that the, the the challenge is on determining the distance. the uh, The velocity itself you could read from the spectrum. So as long as you got good spectra from those galaxies, you you, you know you you're most likely will have the value of the, the the receding speed of those galaxies however the distance is something else it's it requires you to to understand what you, what you're looking at because those distance must be must be um, estimated using something that uh, um, located on those galaxies and there must be very very bright that um, you could measure various things about them. So um, distance in cosmology is uh, maybe one would say the number one big homework. Um, and it is still going on. And you you heard from Professor Permac yesterday that um, we've got really deep trouble, uh, what people call the Hubble tension these days. So you, you don't have an agreement um, um, between um, very standard observations of two particular uh, methods. And that is a serious problem, not just having, having um, um, statistical or um, um, accuracy problem that perhaps has to do with uh, more fundamental on how we use um, cosmology or understand cosmology that manifests itself on on how galaxies are moving from us or moving from each other. Okay, I hope so far so good. Now, from all those um, um, observations, we try to, to put together a framework with which we try to decipher how the universe is as a physical entity. Now, 
you might think this is a, a, a paramount challenge. Well, it is. Um, we are at a very small place, very limited in our um, uh, access to the whatever is there in the universe. Yet we try to, to understand, to, um, to have ideas, physical ideas, scientific ideas of all those. And um, so how, how are we going to do that? How do we go about uh, trying to study something which is much, much larger than us and um, where most of everything is not accessible? So what we do is just making assumptions. But of course, those assumptions must be reasonable must be um, checkable from time to time and also uh, uh, has, has a very, very strong logical reasoning upon which we could formulate something on it. So the first one is what we call the homogeneity in isotropy over large scale. So we have seen that the galaxies are distributed very, very uniformly. And, but this only over a very, very large scale, which is uh, in the order of 100 megaparsec. And uh, you, you could say that, that the second point is corollary of the first, but you know I, I put it explicitly nonetheless, that there is no special place in the universe, such that any point in the universe would have a galaxy map that the same thing, the same galaxy map that we have right here. So if you go to, you know, one of those distant galaxies and do all the surface that those people did, you would have the same large scale feature on average. So that what we mean by uh, by those two points. And these are called the cosmological principle or some people call it the principle of mediocrity that, you know, what we see is just average. Every other place, you know, every other observer at the, in one of those galaxies would pretty much see the same thing. Now this principle gives you a, uh, a geometry that has a, is a symmetry on on very much what we call spherical symmetry, um, almost like what we think about the spherical as a ball, but not quite. But uh, um, I, I will perhaps go through that if we have time. But so, so this is good. So the geometry of Robertson Walker tells you that this principle tells you that the universe must have a uh, curvature which is the same in all place. So it's almost like if you see a, a very smooth ball, you know, the smoothest ball I could, I could think of as a ping pong ball, but you, you know, you think of a gigantic ping pong ball, it's a smooth surface and no, no point on the surface, you, 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 you feel bump, it's very smooth. So the universe is very much like that on a large scale. Okay, now this, the second uh, bit that you need to put in a framework is uh, not just geometry, you, you need to have, well, how, do, how do they move? How do how all these galaxies get together? How are they formed, first of all? So for those, you need, you need physics. And the, the physics, which is um, dominant, within that large scale is gravity. So gravity is the interaction between massive objects. So massive objects do interact through gravitation. And if you work over a very large scale, then most of the constituents within those large scale are 
neutral matter in the sense that um, other interaction, say electromagnetic, could be um, could play a very very minor role in the sense that since the uh, dominant or the majority of the, the matter are already in neutral state, the interaction, the, the electromagnetic interaction, the Coulomb interaction compensate each other. So whereas mass has no uh, has no polarity as such that the, you know what you can do is just accumulate. So therefore within the large scale gravity is the dominant force. And for a very large scale, where you need to perhaps uh, accommodate geometry in it, you probably um, need general relativity to have a more um, encompassing picture of the of how universe works. So adding number one and number two together give you what is now called the Friedman, the method. Robertson Walker models. These are models, um, you know, finer models within um, a unifying way of doing cosmology is, uh, is uh, what we, perhaps most people these days call it the standard model for cosmology. Okay. Um, some people would perhaps um, put it in a more explicit way. So if you uh, have a, an acu Einstein equation, the Einstein field equation, which is the, uh, the one uh, described in general relativity, and you apply that in a particular uh, system, with this, which is the universe, with this particular geometry, then you will have a set of equation which dynamically described by these two gentlemen, Friedman and Lametta, and with the uh, geometrical solution described by these two gentlemen, Robertson and Walker. So uh, without going through the detail how the friedman lametta equation are um, derived, I will just give you an illustration. What is it that um, they're trying to describe? They're trying to describe a universe which could be dynamic, which is allowed to be uh, um, doing changes on it. But the, the way it, it does changes is, is is still uniform, you know, because the cosmological principle is 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 held. So what they the, the universe could do, you know, by allowing its changes, just move. It's just uh, 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 changing its size. It's going bigger or smaller, but retaining all the details of the of the geometry. So, for example, you consider this uh, small balloon right there with uh, pictures of galaxies on the surface and also pictures of a photon uh, wave or a light wave. Um, and you, you allow this uh, sphere to expand. And why it's expanding, you know, it, there's no, no uh, changes on the detailed feature. It's just growing bigger. Now, uh, what is it that we see that is happening or, or um, changing on the configuration of the galaxies? Well, the galaxies seem to be sitting where they are. You know, if, if this galaxy is on this particular cross and this is here, you know, um, then while the, th this balloon grows bigger, th the galaxies are still on the same spot. But if you try to measure the distances 
between any pair of the galaxies, you'll see that the distance grow larger. So what we see here is that uh, the galaxies are just moving away from one another following the expansion of the universe. Now the universe itself is of course not a ball like this, but this is just a very simplistic illustration that we need to borrow to, to give you an idea of uh, how this this uh, construction of framework is put together. So um, I will introduce here what we call as a, a radius or distance between between um, galaxies or between objects, and also what we call or we will use quite a bit later is a co-moving coordinate that we will uh, indicate as x here. So. If you will, you could imagine that X is somewhat represented by these horizontal and vertical lines, this just coordinate. And they are co-moving co because they're, they're just the same configuration, except each box, is, each box grows larger, that's all. So, but, so if you want to, to, to estimate the real size of them, then you just, which is uh, indicated by R, so at a time from time to time, so this T indicates the time, um, the size, the real size, the physical size at particular time, any arbitrary time, is X times this um, factor called the scale factor A. So A tells you how, how, how the universe, how much the universe has, has changed in its size. So X tells you that uh, the galaxies are not moving in their position. They're just merely um, growing apart because the, the space uh, where they are is expanding. So you, you imagine if you, uh, you know, one of you, I think you're, quite many of you are from India. So for example, the distance, you want to calculate the distance between a city in India and a city in Indonesia. While you're doing that, the Earth keep expanding. So even though you're not moving, you're just sitting in your home. For whatever reason, the, the Earth is expanding. Then the distance between those two cities are also expanding. So this is the same idea. So the Friedman method equation is derived using this particular um, idea where within within the universe you you have mass of course you've got all these galaxies you've got us in it so the universe is bound to have mass so what what can we use of the our understanding about having mass well if the universe is everything that it is then all the mass it has or if you if you will energy that it has will stay within the universe, not gonna go anywhere because there's no out and there's, because there's no out, there's no um, um, external agent coming out to, to, uh, to, to other, to, to the outside of the universe and there's nothing coming in. So at, at this point, uh, the, the Friedman model has this idea that the universe is already everything. So talking about outside the universe is meaningless in that particular point. So with that uh, constraint, all the mass that the universe has will stay within. So when the universe expands, what changes is of course its density, the same mass is divided by a larger volume. So the, the density at any arbitrary time is the density that the now, for example, um, divided by how much the the the, um, the universe has expanded, or the size of that particular um, universe at particular time. So A tells you a lot of things. It, A tells you the scale of the universe at any arbitrary time. So how how the universe changed with time is is embedded in our knowledge about A. So therefore, 
what what goes in is to see how a behave so a again the, is a scale factor this is not the acceleration that the basic mechanics use in its uh, notation so a double dot is this the second order uh, derivative of a with respect to t so since um, we can put a as r on x so this is the same thing r is the only thing that depends on time and x is not so x stays uh, constant and you have this particular relation which which must look familiar to you because the 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 left hand side gives you uh, a measure of uh, change of change of size whereas the, the 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 far right hand side equation tells you you know what's within the system and it's almost like the potential energy and in fact it is and the 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 the, the next equation which is the a dot which tells you the the change of uh, of a with with time square so this is almost like velocity so the velocity is is actuated balanced by the potential plus plus something this is and gives you uh, again the uh, reminiscence of seeing the um, the conservation of total energy kinetic plus potential equals something where this something is uh, what we call the the uh, the constant of integration so if you do in integrate an equation and you don't give a, a boundary then you will have uh, a formulation for the integration plus a constant of integration which value depends again if you if you give a boundary condition then you will determine the um, the constant of integration so the constant of integration k here uh, tells you the the in a way a constraint how the system is uh, uh, moving this way or that um, is constrained by the total energy that the system has and within this particular um, framework for cosmology k is often um, interpreted as the curvature of the space of the universe so no matter how um, how uh, the interplay between the kinetic and the potential energy the curvature gives you some kind of boundary that you, you could only move or change within within this constraint so it is um, a very um, it's very good that we have this this uh, uh, constructed because it, it it came from first principle which is the, the conservation of total energy uh, the interplay again between the kinetic and the potential energy and here the constant of integration is interpreted as the curvature so we have the geometry accommodated in this equation and we've got the kinetic and the potential energies uh, clearly defined so the kinetic tells you how fast the, the universe is expanding the potential tells you okay we've got this much of mass you know you cannot just expand it you will but also this geometry tells you that how you how you expand how you how you or not expand uh, you know I have got to control this this curvature tells you that so uh, so so far so good so you you must uh, appreciate this this accomplishment because again the universe is so large to even think about it is is a real breakthrough on the, on getting us to work Okay, let me check the time. How are we on, on time? Are we okay? 
Okay, we've got another. Maybe if, maybe five minutes left. Okay, okay, I still Thanks. have lots. So okay, so I'll try to uh, be quick about this Friedman Lometer equation because this is this is very important and also again very very critical in our understanding of uh, of other um, topics that you will encounter later in the, in this fortnight is that uh, I, I tried to put together the friedman lometa equation, trying to be clean about it, and uh, put them in uh, two distinguished, um, uh, distinguishable um, uh, form. The first one is called the energy equation, because again, it reminds you, and actually it came from the, the uh, total energy equation. The, Again, you, you recognize the, the left-hand side being the kinetic and the right-hand side being the potential plus the, the constant of integration, if you will. Now, the second form is uh, what people sometimes use, the acceleration equation of the force equation, because, it, again, it has the, the, uh, uh, the familiar um, form of a double dot here, which, you know, uh, again, something that goes like acceleration. And if you remember the F equals M times times acceleration. So this is very much like a force um, um, per unit mass, whereas the, the right hand side is what you call a source. So uh, Newton said, you know, an object would stay uh, put or move in a, in, a, in a constant velocity unless a force is acting on it. So this is, this is that equation, a force which is acting on the universe, which is causing it to, to, to expand. And then we will ask whether it's going to expand on a constant uh, speed or whether it's going to slow down or it's going to go faster. This, this right hand will tell you, will determine that. And um, the next thing is a parameter that we will uh, use uh, quite often, and it's just to make everything more compact in in its appearance for the friedman lometa coin. Because this this is already very nice, but you've got so many parameters here, and you don't know how to 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 solve. The idea is to solve for a. So this is like a um, uh, equations, a set of equations of motion, and this is your dynamical or your source equation, which you need to solve to get meaning, sol solving meaning you get A as a function of T, meaning you know how the universe size from time to time. Okay, so put, to put things into more neat uh, form, you introduce this thing, which is called the critical density. Critical density is the density of the universe which will make it flat, which is make it have zero curvature, or k, the in constant of integration that we saw before, to have value zero. So this critical density is just this definition. This is the value. This is awfully small. So just 10 to the minus gram per, per cubic centimeter. This is almost not even an atom per, per, per teaspoon, this is awfully small. So this is pretty much the critical density of the universe to make it flat, to make it having no curvature. Now, having introduced this um, critical density, the next thing is to, to introduce a new parameter, which will be our friend for forever, for, for those of you doing cosmology, is this omega. So this omega with all the subscripts, is nothing but the ratio of the current um, or or, uh, or the density of any particular time uh, over the critical density of that particular time. Now, cosmology is again a weird uh, doing of doing things. They they put subscript zero to indicate um, the current time today now. And some other people use uh, zero to indicate initial time, but in cosmology, zero means, or subscript zero means now. Okay, so rho zero, meaning the, the density of the universe now, 
if you do uh, divide that by the critical density of it now, which is this value, you get or you define an omega sub zero, meaning the density parameter of the universe now. Now the, the density parameter is a summation of the, de the um, uh, density of all its constituents. So again, we will see more later. This is m, this matter, r is radiation, and lambda um, is the cosmological constant, or sometimes people call the uh, vacuum energy or the dark energy. So this um, this is again the density of matter now, density of radiation now, and density of vacuum energy now. So using all these new friends in your um, uh, energy equation, you you have this Friedman um, equation for energy written in this compact manner. So how fast the universe expands at any particular time, at any arbitrary time, depends on how fast the universe is expanding now times all these things, which tells you what the universe has. You know, in, in terms of radiation and matter and the dark energy or, or um, vacuum energy and its curvature. So this is a very compact uh, piece of equation. It looks simple and it could be, uh, again, um, uh, solved for A, uh, depending on, on you know, how complex you, you want to solve your equation. You, so you, you, you could just you know, well, remember your, your mathematical physics class and how to, to, to solve a differential equation with, with uh, um, with uh, many parameters working. Oh, uh, let me see. Sh should I continue or t stop or take questions or? Maybe, yeah. We will continue to question and answer Susan. Okay. Let let's do that. Okay. Okay. Thanks for your great uh, lecture as usual. Uh, okay. Uh, today, Hey, today. Uh, now uh, I would like to open the, my chat box here. Um, share and then get to okay. see all of you. Okay, now I will invite uh, Ilham Prasetyo. Are you there, Ilham? Yes, I'm there. Yes. Yeah, you can uh, ask directly to Premanasan, please. Uh, I want to ask about the first. Uh, uh, slides about the uh, large, large uh, scale structure of the universe uh, in your presentations. Is that somehow related to the uh, cosmic microwave background that uh, was uh, detected by the WMAP uh, satellite? Yeah, sh shall I answer right away? Or? Okay, yeah, you can yes, answer. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, that, your, your, your question is to the right direction. Um, we have the galaxy distribution as a, as a closer distribution of uh, matter or a source of photons, if you will, that we could detect. Um, later, people try to compare that distribution of galaxies with the distribution of photons that come in from a much, much earlier uh, period or epoch of, uh, uh, of the universe history, which is the time when photons were just able to break free from, from their interaction with matter. So be far before that, um, matter and photon uh, were so intensely interacting that you know photon could could not um, propagate very far, so that that was un, you know uh, that kept going on until the universe was about three hundred four hundred uh, thousand years old after uh, after the beginning after the big bang, so those photons are are the first generations of photon that could propagate freely and most of them could reach us now at a much 
a lower frequency, of course, because of the redshift that we saw before. And they are, they are called the cosmic microwave background radiation. Now, um, the cosmic microwave uh, background radiation is uh, measured by their temperature. And their temperature is very, very uniform, extremely uniform. And it's got a feature of a cosmic, uh, of a black body um, um, spectrum, you know, the Planck spectrum. But if you, if you analyze it in a very, very fine manner, you will still able to see there are this small uniform, in uniformity, or it will call anisotropy, uh, that you could measure, and they're very small, but they're not um, zero. They're they're finite, and and if you compare the non-uniformity of um, cosmic microwave background temperature with the galaxy uh, distribution, it seems like the, um, they are they're talking to each other. So I'll try to put that into the uh, into the next lecture about the distribution of inhomogeneity. Okay, thanks. Uh, we will continue to another uh, participant. Maybe Hina Safdar from Pakistan. Are you there? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Please. Uh, my question is, uh, as the universe is expanding, will it continue to expand forever? Well, uh, that's, uh, that's very much uh, depending upon the, the Friedman equation, the, the, um, the cosmological parameter that I have introduced to you, the omegas, the value of all those omegas, and the value of uh, H0, the Hubble constant, will determine whether the universe will expand forever and the manner it will expand so you know it, it's going to expand with the constant velocity or it's going to expand with the diminishing velocity or in some case in a very certain case the universe will expand to a certain uh, size and then start recollapsing so it, um, so uh, i uh, probably won't be able to go through to each of those um, model in detail. I invite you to read uh, uh, Barbara Ryden's really excellent book. I think it's on chapters five, four and five, if not five and six. But also I, uh, I'll try to give some illustration in, in our review session later this afternoon. But yes, uh, the, the, that's the idea. So the framework that we just put together will allow you to see if you're if you're successful in, in solving a of t out of the Friedman equation with all the various parameters you 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 you, you know you you put uh, values for then then basically it tells you how the universe will change in its size from time to time so all these parameters decide the manner of how the universe will expand all right, thank you. Okay, thanks, Hina. And uh, maybe uh, Harsang Nimongkar from India. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Good morning. Uh, okay. Thank you for the wonderful uh, talk. And uh, my question is, uh, how does the Hubble tension affect the estimated age of the universe? Well, uh, it's... Uh, it's a very good question, and I think it, it you know, it uh, it relates to what uh, lots of people are worrying about in cosmology, and and Professor Pramak uh, mentioned about that yesterday. Well, that depends on uh, if you remember his uh, graph yesterday, where he uh, he put a um, uh, an area over the universe history, how the 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 universe expands in time, where it uh, where the radiation domination was followed by matter domination and matter domination was followed by the dark energy domination. And during that transition between the matter domination and the dark energy, he put a little bump. And depending on how long that uh, bump is affecting the, the expansion of the universe, 
then the, the uh, determination of age might be affected. But if uh, it happens only a very short period of, of the universe history, maybe the, the age itself is not uh, affected so much, but then the, the size would be very much affected. That, that is the, the trick um, of this whole business because we use distant, distance as a way of a, or as a proxy of time. We can't measure time in cosmology. Who would take a stopwatch and start it? You know, okay, this is, we're going to start the universe. You, you click the stopwatch and then, you know, you let the time go and then you wait and then you look at the time. Okay, this is the first, the first stars is, is popping out and then the first galaxy is merging and, and so on. You know, there is no being that doing this uh, stopwatch um, monitoring. So time is, is a good um, parameter in all physical uh, system, but in cosmology, it is still usable when you, we just do um, formulation, doing, math, doing mathematics or doing the, uh, the, the theory. But in practice, we can't measure time. There is no universal clock. So therefore we have to find something else which, is, which serves as a proxy of time. So uh, the, the scale factor in a way does that for time. But then again, who can measure the universe? You know, we, we cannot just stretch a, 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 a meter from here and then go to another galaxy and reading the tape meter. Okay, oh, this is such and such mega parsec already. No, so, so, so therefore the, the, the redshift is our hero here. The redshift is measurable. We could read that on the spectra of all those galaxies. And the, the spectra tells you the speed of how, how fast the galaxy is moving from us. And since the, 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 the good relation that, sh show, that is shown in, in, in Hubble graph between the velocity, which, which is um, proportional to the speed, with the distance. So you could see that uh, if you could read the speed of those galaxies, then in a way you could have a measure of their distance from us. So Z or redshift is in a way a proxy of time as well as a proxy of, of scale. So now if you have that in your mind, so if you, if you decide on the distance and you have this Hubble tension going on, you might be confused with how you relate this with time. Okay, so, so that's, the, that's the idea. So, so the longer that uh, little bump happens, the messed up your relation between time and, and distance. So what perhaps people would do is just making making lots of observation um, within uh, redshift bins because if, if uh, those thing that you know the transition happen within a particular uh, range of redshift you concentrate on that and see what happened uh, whether the universe really expanded much much faster before uh, compared to before and compared to after but it just happened in short time then the, you know afterwards the, the universe continues to expand just just leisurely or or what so those are the things that people need to to go through before um, before concluding how time is sort of could be affected or the, the age of the universe could be affected by Hubble tension. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh... Maybe the next question uh, related to Hubble tension. Uh, I will invite the Muhammad Farrell from Indonesia. Please, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, I want to ask a question about uh, Hubble tension. Uh, what would scientists do to solve about this Hubble tension? Is it possible if after all this time we want about model of ammo that we construct? As you say, uh, sorry, I just missed your last uh, sentence. Would you re kindly repeat? Okay, okay. Uh, in the precision cosmology, we know that nowadays research gives us information about 
Hubble tension. And what would scientists do to solve about this Hubble tension? Is it possible if after all this time we wrong about model or maybe framework that we construct? Construct as you said before, uh, we use framework that uh, principal cosmology and uh, Friedman limiter, Robertson water model. Maybe if uh, could possible if we wrong after all this time. Thank you. Yeah. Well. Um... Of course, uh, uh, I don't think anyone is uh, confident about how to answer this question. Um, what I'm trying to, to say is that the Friedman model has incredibly worked so well for various, um, for various feature that we could see uh, in the universe. Uh, later in the, in the next uh, session, I will I will try to to uh, to illustrate what I'm trying, what I mean by that, by by introducing how the structure evolved, and this, uh, this the amazing thing that the structure evolved is again from the first principle, from just gravitational uh, perturbation, you know, that built up and then and then put the structure together. This is against the the um, the the, the the uh, continuous expansion of the universe. Now, um, so all those things seem to work very well. So if there should be any modification of the, of the Friedman model, I would bet it's not going to be uh, uh, a major uh, overhaul. It could be um, uh, a finer modification uh, on the on on our ideas of dark energy, but we haven't really have good consensus on 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 it anyway. And also, the dark matter, although the dark matter might not play a huge role in this Hubble tension, it could. Again, you know, we don't know how the universe evolved and the detail that uh, the the dark matter played in each uh, period of the structure evolution. But um, dark energy is, is something that we, we are completely still in the dark and people use all sort of theories and you know, ideas are, are elaborated. But uh, the, the, the main thing is to, to check on the, on the uh, through observation, the, the various details that could manifest out of the detail um, ideas of dark energy and and if there is a modification as, as I mentioned that perhaps would not um, uh, over uh, make an overhaul change of the Friedman it could just be a, a refinement of how the the dark energy uh, is uh, is uh, playing in the in the Friedman so so the dark energy is is one of the the uh, uh, components on the right hand equation of the Friedman equation, but uh, it it consists of the the majority of the constituents. So therefore, you know, it's 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 not the only thing. But if you allow it to to have a large value, then it could um, uh, play the, a more important role. But but as uh, Professor Premack mentioned yesterday, it could play the role, you know, a number of times during the history of the universe, but not in the same manner every time. So that that is uh, that is uh, that is tricky. That means you you cannot put one particular uh, recipe for dark energy that works for all time. So that's probably uh, my quench my my uh, answer for that. Okay, uh, thanks. Thank Maybe, yeah, for uh, the last question in this season, uh, from Naman Bajay from India, please. Are you, you there? Doctor. Okay. I wanted to know if uh, the basic assumption that the large structure of the universe is symmetric still mm -hmm. valid because I recently came around a research from University of Kansas 
mm-hmm. which says uh, that the there is an asymmetry in the spin of the galaxies so let's see if i cut your question uh, correct so you are worrying about the symmetry of the universe uh, conflicting with observation that the galaxy is spinning uh, is with the conflict conflict that uh, there is an asymmetry in the spin axis of the galaxies ah more than half of the galaxies are spinning in one direction and a less number of galaxies are spinning in the other direction right yeah it's a uh, uh, we don't know the the how to answer that but i hope the simulations that uh, joel showed you yesterday of how galaxies are formed galaxies are formed uh, mainly driven by by the agglomeration of dark matter because baryon is much much less compared to dark matter but whereas what we see in galaxies of of course the is baryonic part which is just the 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 minor part of it, of them now um many galaxies if not were um uh, form um in in a large neighborhood in a large uh, halo of dark matter so uh, it is uh, intriguing to see that uh, how they they collapsed and then you know they continue spinning this way or that is uh is uh in a way uh an indication of the angular um momentum that brought all those clumps together and and some becoming galaxies some are probably just remaining as a stark matter so if you uh consider that these uh angular momentum that is uh, retained if, if not even built up you know that manifest as um the rotation of of uh, the disk that you see in in a uh, disky galaxy or spiral galaxy then the very small but uh, existing rotation of uh, more spheroidal galaxies are are reminiscing of those uh angular momentum with which the dark matter are collapsing now if the uh, universe or the matter of the universe started from a much much smaller volume when the universe was much much younger then it is a uh, it, it is problematic in a way that they 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 tend to have a, a a a preferred direction so if you do a simulation what you do usually is you have a, a distribution of matter and you put some some um, a contrast on it so you have a very very homogeneous spread of matter at the very very beginning and you just add a little bit very very little bit of um, of uh, um contrast on top of that in the same way you do with velocity so you've got velocity field which is very very uniform in the beginning you just add a little bit of disturbance in velocity now all those things grow with with the uh, with uh, with time so well not all of course that depends on how 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 the density contrast evolve comparing to the to the um to the expansion of the universe but most of some of them would continue to grow the mass would come together and the and this the uh, velocity of field would also um, evolve some would just diminish some would just uh, evolve into what we call now the the, the rotation so uh, uh, the accumulation of matter would um perhaps uh, dictate how the angular momentum um, builds uh, along the 
along the uh, evolved structure. But it would be uh, interesting to see the velocity field of the non uh, non form non galactic forming dark matter. Uh, I hope you, you you see what I'm trying to say. There are a lot more of dark matter uh, which are not uh, uh, forming galaxies or not um, ha having enough baryon to to construct galaxies. Now we need to see the velocity field of those dark matter. If they are uh, uh, found to have a preferred direction, then you know what you worry might be uh, might manifest. But if they don't, then you know the 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 uh, preferred or the the spin uh, problem is uh, perhaps more on the later um, evolution of the galaxies, not on the dark matter itself. I think. Thank you. Um, yeah. Okay, maybe we need to stop uh, the uh, question and answer session for this uh, lecture. Uh, I see there is uh, there are some uh, questions left, but most of them about the uh, fate of fate of uh, the universe. So I think that uh, this uh, topic will be discussed uh, later. So yeah. Uh, before we close this uh, meeting, we uh, I would like to invite you all to open your uh, videos. We will all take right, a picture for, for this season again, like before. So okay, wait. Uh, okay, I will start to take a picture for slide one. Slide one, so please keep smile. <laughs> okay, one, two, three. Okay, next uh, second slide. Okay, there is three slides for this session. So, okay, for second slide. Okay, the third one. Okay. okay, thanks everyone. Uh, now I would like to invite you to open your mic and uh, uh, give applause for uh, Premana Sang for her lecture today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope it wasn't too bad. Thank you. Because <laughs> we have to survive me and that for another. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you later.